In this lecture I will be concentrating on uh, a very important uh, aspect of material synthesis that is uh, through hydrothermal route and uh, hydrothermal synthesis is a very important technique because it combines the principle of both chemistry as well as physical approach uh, where we are trying to use chemical routes but uh, incorporating high pressures. So, this is one technique which is 50-50 of both physical as well as chemical approach. Therefore, I have dedicated one full lecture on this to understand the principle behind it, how we can fine tune and the scope of this method which has not only been used for lab scale synthesis, but also has gone into tons of material synthesis in the <coughs> past few decades. As I uh, have pointed out hydrothermal is a high pressure synthesis therefore, the moment you think about high pressure you think of a bomb or a enclosure in other words you do the reaction in a confined system closed system therefore, high pressures will be generated from within and uh, this is another cartoon which we will see down through the slides. Um, the specificity of a hydrothermal route by which one can aim for a particular morphology of a crystal and then you can get it. Um, and also if you want to grow crystals this is one of the facile route by which you can grow single crystals as you would see this is one of the uh, gemstone which is prepared uh, with the near perfection and uh, hydrothermal can therefore, be used for scalability also it is not just limited to lab scale approach. Now, where does uh, hydrothermal, uh, hydrothermal synthesis uh, stands? If you look at the conventional methods for uh, fine ceramic powders, the top down approach is the mechanical milling where you start from uh, powders uh, of irregular size and shape and then you ball mill it and try to get it in nano size and uh, then comes the chemistry routes uh, a long list of chemistry routes where precipitation or thermal decomposition of different natures can uh, help in making materials. And as you would see here hydrothermal itself now transcends to be a area of research because of the uh, facile nature by which we can modulate the synthesis. And uh, on the right side this cartoon shows uh, a list of uh, hydrothermal synthesis that has emerged over the years. As you would see this is an endless result. You can start with just a crystal growth and uh, we often think hydrothermal is to initiate a crystal growth or crystallization process, but it is much more than that. You can actually do hydrothermal treatment, do dehydration extraction that is leaching. Uh, from minerals. Then you can also attempt for hydrothermal sintering. Uh, we can do hydrothermal oxidation and uh, decomposition reactions can be done and then hydrothermal electrochemical mechanochemical reactions can also be engineered and uh, over the years the usefulness of uh, hydrothermal process has also transcended to uh, a, a fusion of two different approaches. For example, hydrothermal ultrasonic hydrothermal microwave reactions are also aimed. So, that whatever target compounds that we have it is very easy to prepare if you can integrate two different approaches. And uh, then of course, you also have this melting and rapid quenching which is nothing but crystal growth technique which we will also see in one of our lectures. So, as you would see here this is a endless um, route and uh, there are a lot of combinations that are possible and as we record this lecture today uh, a decade from now hydrothermal can transcend to other various avenues also. So, we will just look at few examples first of all the principles of hydrothermal uh, growth or uh, hydrothermal process and then take specific examples to understand what are its limitation and what is the landscape of uh, this hydrothermal process. Um, to start with let us say uh, hydrothermal synthesis is all about the react reactants are dissolved or placed in water or another solvent. If you put it in some solvent organic or inorganic solvents then you call that as solvothermal. 
you call it hydrothermal if you just use water or you can use water with some additives that is also called as solvothermal in one sense. Now, you put the whole thing in a bomb and uh, this is uh, this is actually a metal outer, outer surface is a metal, but then what you see inside can be a bomb with Teflon um, containers. Therefore, this is not the container by itself, this is a bomb to just control and uh, release and uh, through this orifice you can also try to leak out a gas. So, that the it is not a if it is not a controlled um, close uh, vessel reaction it can turn out to be a bomb. Therefore, you can actually release it with a small diaphragm which can actually leak out excess uh, pressure. So, this is uh, the simplest way we can uh, define a hydrothermal reaction and uh, this bomb is heated above the boiling point of the liquid either solvent or water. So, that you reach its super criticality and we can also try to do this heating in a conventional furnace or we can do uh, have a special arrangement by which we can heat it inside or we can engineer it in a more sophisticated way nowadays using microwave oven and uh, commercially tons of zeolites uh, being made by hydrothermal uh, process mainly because uh, making zeolites or cage structures is a, a very challenging um, work or very challenging uh, uh, attempt and therefore, expertise is needed to get the size and shape control of the end product. So, zeolites uh, I will show one example of how this has made inroads into application but we can actually talk in terms of tons of zeolites can be made using such uh, autoclaves. Now, what are the conditions solvent whether it is water or any other solvent <coughs> it is taken to uh, its boiling point and uh, usually uh, some basic uh, solvents are also added uh, like sodium hydroxide potassium hydroxide. So, most of the reactions are done in basic conditions and uh, this particular method is also used for making nano oxides for example, simple oxides uh, or substituted ones layered oxides can be transformed into nano wires or tubes and then carbon nanotubes has been formed this way and some elemental nanostructures also has been attempted. So, this is not just confined to uh, bulk material, but also nano materials. Now, when we look at the <coughs> phase diagram um, and then look at uh, how uh, how we get into this uh, critical point uh, as we heat um, the autoclave. Now, water actually will uh, will show different density and uh, as a function of temperature as you would see at low temperatures or at room temperature the density of water is 1, but as we heat the water you have a competition between the liquid phase and the gas phase and uh, at precisely 374.15 which is the critical temperature of water you can achieve this critical point with a density of 0 0.321. So, density or the viscosity of your water will change with temperature. So, the water at 300 degree C will have a density of 0.75 gram per cc uh, for the liquid phase and for the gas phase it will be 0 0.05 gram per centimeter cube. So, above the critical temperature and critical pressure you have this super critical and fluid phase. So, this is the critical point that we try to achieve in the bomb uh, or in the autoclave. Uh, when we think of uh, uh, solvo thermal reactions there are some general aspects that we can have in mind. Usually more material can be dissolved at high temperatures therefore, we slowly increase the uh, temperature in the bomb and uh, the properties of the water also changes along with the material that we are dissolving. For example, with increasing temperature the ionic product uh, increases viscosity will decrease and the polarity will decrease 
but with pressure polarity of water that is the dielectric constant will also change. As a result the reaction of water itself behavior of water itself will be different in its uh, uh, critical temperature. So, synthesis is usually in closed vessels. So, all three parameters become very crucial. So, they are interdependent. Uh, we cannot just uh, simply worry about uh, the temperature and pressure because volume is a intrinsic stuff which is involved there. Therefore, volume plays a very critical role in modifying the dynamics of uh, hydrothermal process. There are two methods by which we can do this one is isothermal mainly for uh, powder synthesis where you just take uh, the reaction temperature to 70 degrees or 100 degrees and put this uh, in a furnace for uh, 3 days, 6 days and 7 days and so on. So, recrystallization for example, uh, recrystallization uh, oriented powder synthesis usually involves a long period of time and those are isothermal um, experiments. And then you also have uh, temperature gradient experiments usually if you want to grow a crystal you try to seed a crystal and then slightly, uh, slightly try to provide a temperature gradient. So, as you are going to pull it for over a period of time this crystals will start growing on the seed crystals and you get huge crystals. We will see some examples uh, later. So, in solvothermal uh, synthesis a typical uh, single crystal that is formed is shown here. Synthesis from liquids above boiling point at 1 bar is usually realized. Hydrothermal or solvothermal reactions as, you, as we uh, see. Uh, water is usually used or we can also use ammonia, some mineral acids can be used, uh, even carbon dioxide and uh, SO2 can be used and uh, these days because of green chemistry uh, supercritical carbon dioxide is now taking more attention than even hydrothermal process because carbon dioxide in its critical state can become a very good uh, uh, solvent also. So, this is actually uh, becoming a prime focus in green chemistry and of also you can see uh, alcohols which can perform the job. If we are aiming for sulphides then H2S gas can be used. So, a variety of solvents can be used. Uh, ammonia is a common solvent and carbon dioxide is becoming important. Uh, so, in hydrothermal crystallization we are actually aiming for large crystals and gemstones. This is how they it is made and uh, in hydrothermal synthesis by and large we are talking about preparing powder samples of oxides. When we talk about leaching uh, take ore and then try to leach it with uh, treatment uh, with the treatment uh, with some alkali. For example, uh, alumina uh, you try to take bauxite ore and then try to leach it with sodium hydroxide then you will be able to get uh, uh, Al 2 O 3 on calcination. So, this is one way you can try to do a leaching. So, several things can happen in the bomb and we can see some of the uh, issues in the slides. One of the prime criteria for hydrothermal synthesis is the pressure temperature diagram which is very important and we need to know what is the loading factor that uh, will uh, give you the optimum pressure that you are looking for. Uh, the autogenous pressure in a closed vessel can achieve uh, different proportions depending on the filling. Uh, for example, if you are talking about 32 percent filling of water in a autoclave then it will expand as you increase the temperature it will fill the autoclave at the critical temperature at higher filling degrees the water will expand to fill the autoclave at temperatures below the critical temperature. So, this will actually result in a steep increase in pressure inside the autoclave due to differences in com compressibility of gas and liquid. For example, you take the case of uh, uh, 80 percent filling uh, of autoclave then uh, at 250, uh, 45 degree C we are somewhere here we can actually blow up the autoclave. So, optimum filling is somewhere around 20 30 where you see 
the pressure is not steeply increasing it is moderately increasing therefore you have a fine control over the pressure build up inside the vessel. So, this uh, pressure versus temperature plot gives you an idea uh, suppose I am going to take only 10 percent of the filling then I can play around with this whole regime of temperature because the pressure that is achieved is highly controllable. So, depending on the volume of the pressure vessel that you are taking and depending on the nature of oxide that we are trying to prepare we can play around with any one of this parameter. So, this is a guideline to, uh, to ascertain whether you are in a safe zone. So, if we happily try to fill the uh, pressure vessel with 80 or 70 percent then even at 200 degree C you will be generating very very high pressures where the uh, pressure vessel cannot stand such a pressure. So, we should be beware of gas evolving or low boiling seven which can increase the pressure at a given temperature. So, uh, we should also understand that the starting materials by itself should not release extra gases apart from the um, pressure that we are generating. So, during the reaction if some decomposition process is happening and that is going to release some more of gas then that will add up to the inherent uh, pressure that is getting built up. Therefore, we should be cautious or a back calculation is needed as to how much of starting material on heating at what temperature will give uh, what amount of pressure. So, all this has to be calculated. So, pressure and temperature uh, along with the volume uh, is a very governing criteria. So, this is a useful information that one should know, uh, but in some cases hydrothermal process is very reluctantly progressing mainly because it needs some amount of catalyzing agent which we call it as mineralizers. Such mineralizers are usually needed for the crystallization to occur. The solubility of the materials is not always sufficient. So, mineralizers are generally used for crystallization process. The best examples of uh, such mineralizers are either some alkali fluorides, alkali hydroxides, alkali metal hydroxides which can uh, do the job. Uh, for example, quartz is synthesized in a temperature gradient at 1 uh, kilo bar. The solubility is too low for efficient crystallization. As a result, several mineralizers are added to improve on the solubility of SiO2. Uh, so, if you want to make some silicates or zeolites, uh, just taking pure silica in water is not sufficient. Therefore, you can put uh, any of this mineralizer. As you can see here, solubility is going to increase very rapidly if you are going to work out with the sodium hydroxide and again the molarity of the hydroxides also matter in increasing the solubility of SiO2. So, you can see a variety of combinations there for example, zinc sulphide you want to grow then potassium hydroxide is a very good candidate, zinc oxide if you want to go sodium peroxide uh, hydroxide is a very good uh, uh, mineralizer and uh, f alumina also requires uh, such mineralizers for formation. So, solubility as a function of hydroxide concentration is a very useful parameter to uh, know because this can enhance the process to a greater extent. When we think about um, uh, growing large crystals then in a typical autoclave you need to have a temperature gradients and uh, this is how it is you, uh, we will come to this scheme later, but generally you need to have a temperature gradient where you take the nutrients which is nothing but your starting material and then these are the seed crystals where which is hanging there and uh, there is a orifice which will prevent actually the uh, particle flow which is the secondary nucleation from uh, occurring. Therefore, the seed crystals are in a temperature gradient zone where slowly this mineralizers will uh, this nutrients will actually propagate through this uh, baffle and then larger crystals will start growing. So, this is uh, another way of making the larger crystals and uh, 
typical requirements are um, you need to have uh, some weight percent solubility um, ranging from 0 0.001 to 0 0.1 weight percent and uh, the temperature in the growth zone has to be lower than the dissolution zone otherwise you cannot create a progressive temperature uh, gradients and the convection transport the hot liquid up to the growth zone which is the way uh, this seed crystals start uh, acting as nucleation sites for larger crystals to grow. There are some problems also uh, where uh, a retrograde uh, solubility is also encountered uh, especially if you take the case of uh, silica in pure water and in some salt solutions at uh, higher temperatures you would see the solubility actually would come down. So, this also has to be noted uh, you take the case uh, of uh, silica in pure water above 350 degree C uh, as you would see here uh, as you keep on increasing the solubility at very low pressures you would you would see increase in solubility and then it is coming down. So, uh, this range is a retrograde solubility therefore, when you are trying to go to very high temperatures then you need to have a compromise with the pressure in uh, build up inside the bomb otherwise uh, you would not be getting the end, end product. So, we need to have some idea about these phase diagrams where you would know what is the temperature at which I should play and what is the optimum pressure that is required for the uh, quartz uh, for example, to grow quartz. Uh, so, this is a very uh, useful parameter that one should have in mind and uh, we can also have similar calibrations made for halides and uh, carbonates as mineralizers. Uh, there are also other solvents other than what I have mentioned uh, depending on the end product that uh, we are looking for. Uh, for example, if we are talking about amides nitrates then ammonia as a solvent is a very good option. Uh, if you are looking for uh, uh, sulphides <coughs> or uh, elemental compounds then we can think of uh, carbon disulphide or CCL4. Uh, these are all useful materials for making um, a specific uh, end product and uh, if you are looking for sulphides for example, H2S is usually the preferred uh, solvent uh, dissolved in an organic solvent can play a vital role and um, we also have several other uh, brominating and chlorinating agents. Uh, like thionyl uh, chloride and so on which can be used for um, chlorinating transition metal oxides. So, uh, apart from water and uh, organic solvents we can also have a flexibility with other sol uh, solvents uh, such as this. Also this list gives you an idea what is the critical temperature of various solvents that we are using as you as you see. Uh, for water the critical temperature is 374 degrees centigrade where you can achieve up to 220 uh, bar uh, atmosphere. So, this is uh, as far as water is concerned. One of the reason why carbon dioxide is more preferred is you do not have such a great critical temperature. So, even very close to room temperature you should be able to get a supercritical carbon dioxide with the very high uh, pressure that is 73 bars and uh, again you can see some examples of uh, ethanol and methanol they they have um, a critical temperature 243 uh, 240 and uh, here again you can go for very high pressures and in in this whole thing you would see um, for achieving high pressures uh, water is a very critical component or solvent. Um, now, just want to take you back into little bit of the history and show some examples of the earlier work uh, before we go into uh, examples. Uh, hydrothermal synthesis was first uh, explored in 1845 by uh, Schaffholt was the first one to make quartz microcrystals and then uh, using glass tubes um, 
as pressure vessels. Uh, Bunsen in 90, 1848 he made some carbonates uh, as crystals and then on um, there has been several uh, activity and uh, the most important one is 1943 by Nachman uh, Nacken sorry who actually used uh, uh, hydrothermal synthesis for industrial production of uh, quartz and this was the first time the introduction of hydrothermal synthesis was taken seriously and then uh, there has been several books written where the mechanism and the uh, physical implications of hydrothermal synthesis has been studied. So, this was mostly a turning point where uh, hydrothermal synthesis was taken much more seriously just to uh, draw your attention. Um, this piezoelectric properties of quartz was discovered in 1880 and the world production of quartz was aimed in 18, uh, 1985 and up to 1500 tons of quartz has been made using hydrothermal synthesis. Today we do not have just small pressure vessels what I showed you now big autoclaves are there which can uh, help us in doing the scale up operation. So, this is little bit of the history of uh, this hydrothermal process and these are some of the old photographs that tells you how big the autoclaves can be and this is not the autoclave this is actually the seed which was inserted inside. So, the autoclave is actually housed here at the floor level, but this is the seed crystal which is actually lifted you can see that this is hanging and all this uh, white slabs what you are seeing is nothing but a quartz crystal and these quartz crystal as are grown over a period of uh, months to grow into huge size and this is the dimension of the seed crystal uh, in front of uh, a small boy who is taking a look at it and uh, such quality industrial uh, grown quartz crystals have find useful applications in many uh, <clears throat> fields especially in electronics, in watches, in optical uh, equipments like laser windows, uh, prisms all these variety of uh, industrial applications have been engineered with uh, uh, large quantity of uh, quartz crystals and uh, typically uh, the process that occurs is shown here uh, those big blocks of quartz are actually um, precipitating on this seed crystals which is kept here and this is being pulled upward uh, say one, uh, 1 millimeter per hour or 1 millimeter per 2 hours that is the rotation at which it is slowly done therefore, it runs into several days and months before the whole thing is actually pulled out. So, the temperature zone is somewhere here this is the temperature zone and uh, this is uh, mechanically pulled. So, it is not done uh, manually it is mechanically pulled at a very slow rate um, to our naked eye you would not see any movement at all, but that is the way it is engineered. So, once you do a slow um, pulling then a large crystal can be isolated from this. So, um, to grow very uh, big crystals you need a big loading unit also because you need so much of starting material therefore, a big autoclave like this can be um, can be made and as you see here to hold the pressure this is actually done with a lot of huge nuts and bolts therefore, this is a, a real scale up process and uh, some of the hydrothermal uh, crystals which have been grown in the past um, this is zinc oxide crystals and then emerald crystals have been grown and uh, we also have calcite calcium carbonate crystals have been grown using this pro, uh, procedure as you can see uh, big size crystals can be engineered it is not just for uh, lab scale synthesis alone. Advantages of hydrothermal synthesis uh, usually we are playing around with the moderate uh, temperatures you do not need very high temperature because at this temperature you are almost uh, achieving the supercritical temperature of any of the solvents therefore, uh, this is a safe range and as a result this can even be experimented in uh, lab scale. And uh, some advantages of hydrothermal synthesis is it is 
possible to synthesize materials below a transformation temperature. For example, uh, this is the transformation temperature of uh, gamma copper iodide and uh, because we are using temperatures below 300, we can easily stabilize this or for quartz uh, the transition temperature alpha to beta is at 580. Therefore, at low temperatures you can actually um, stabilize one of the phases. And again uh, one other important uh, aspect I will come to this slide um, later, chromium dioxide is a very useful videotape material, it is a ferromagnetic metal and starting from chromium oxide you can prepare uh, CrO2 and as you do this uh, synthesis uh, you will also release uh, oxygen therefore there is a inbuilt uh, uh, pressure that is released during this uh, hydrothermal synthesis what is peculiar here is chromium is uh, usually stable in either chromium 6 or chromium 3 but in hydrothermal synthesis you can actually get chromium 4 as a uh, <coughs> metastable phase. So, CrO2 is not easy to prepare by any other technique other than uh, hydrothermal. In fact, large scale synthesis of chromium dioxide has only been achieved using the only technique that is hydrothermal. No other technique has given such um, precise control over the oxidation state. And then preparation of metastable phases um, we can do, we can try to achieve and one of the other very useful uh, parameter or very useful implication of hydrothermal synthesis is uh, control of the zeolite morphology. We can make cage structures using a hydrothermal approach. Uh, comparing zeolite synthesis with biological process, we, we should understand how much uh, we are uh, blessed with the mother nature because uh, we tend to realize uh, this um, uh, with sophisticated cage structures of uh, aluminum silicates uh, using hydrothermal process, but a simple comparison between how this can be easily done biologically uh, will give us some clue um, what the um, biological process means in material synthesis. For example, take the case of zeolites, it will take days together. Uh, if you are going to use hydrothermal process whereas, this will just happen in few hours concentration of this uh, inorganic precursors very harsh environment whereas, very dilute concentration is enough and the pH conditions although comparable now you can achieve uh, using biological process at room temperature the same zeolites can be formed. So, um, we are trying a very hard way to synthesize some unusual inorganic structures, but at the same time mother nature has gifted with a lot of uh, bacterial based or um, enzymatic based reactions which can actually stabilize such very novel uh, motifs of metal oxides uh, in a very fast way. Uh, hydrothermal uh, leaching as I told you is uh, done. Uh, by taking bauxite ore which is nothing but uh, aluminum hydroxide and uh, aluminum oxyhydroxide. So, you can treat this with the uh, sodium hydroxide concentrated solution and they form the respective sodium alum aluminum hydroxide uh, precipitates and this can be um, heated to get corundum structure. So, starting with uh, crude ore we can go for highly pure alpha alumina phase. Uh, by uh, hydrothermal leaching. So, this is one of the uh, important applications. Uh, I will also uh, show you uh, different facets of uh, the autoclaves that are used. Uh, this is uh, one range of autoclave where you have <coughs> this sort of quartz tube which is sealed tubes and the sealed tubes are actually kept inside a bomb or a autoclave where you can use a secondary uh, system like carbon dioxide. In this case, we can actually use carbon dioxide and during heating this will also uh, this will also grow in pressure and this pressure will try to confine the internal pressure otherwise this internal pressure that is generated in the sealed tube will actually explode. Therefore, 
a compromise has to be made in the closed vessel. So, you actually use uh, a external uh, influence uh, like carbon dioxide in this case to restrict the internal pressure from blowing up. So, this is usually done in a closed vessel system. We can also have an open vessel system where you do not use a seal tube. This is again a seal tube. Do not use a seal tube, you just use a open vessel like this, but you can actually block the opening with the bomb, uh, so that the pressure is actually built only here. And uh, th this is another way of uh, uh, generating very high pressure. So, this is called a open ve uh, vessel external uh, pressure based autoclave and in this case you are actually using a sealed capsule and trying to generate uh, high pressure, but at the same time you counteract that high pressure from putting another uh, solvent to uh, combat with the internal pressure. There is another autoclave uh, which is a more autoclave which is nothing but uh, a bomb which is made where the whole thing is heated. The whole bomb is actually heated to high pressures uh, to and to high temperature and uh, this is one way of doing that or we can actually try to uh, heat the vessel here with a open uh, with a open vessel we can try to block this opening and then heat the vessel here, but the top portion can be actually used for cooling. Therefore, uh, very high pressures can be avoided. So, there are two types of autoclaves that you can use for um, making materials and that also depends on what sort of material that we are looking for and what is the scale up operation that we require. There are other issues also which are uh, connected to hydrothermal synthesis. Uh, this particular cartoon tells about uh, EHPH phase diagram which gives a clue uh, what sort of other governing parameters which we can try to operate with during the hydrothermal synthesis. By controlling the potential and the pH during hydrothermal synthesis it is possible to specially control the oxidation state. For example, in the EH versus pH uh, diagram here you can clearly see that uh, if you are planning to stabilize uh, manganese in 2 plus then we need to change the potential of the reaction mixture as well as the pH within this range. And uh, beyond this we can encounter many other uh, phases. Uh, for example, this is uh, MnO2 in plus 4 and Mn2O3 in plus 3, Mn3O4 in 3 and 4 states all these are possible when we go to very high pH. Therefore, uh, if we need a finer control on the oxidation state then we need to take into consideration both the pH as well as the uh, potential that we engage with. Uh, for this reason uh, hydrothermal buffer systems are also used and there are several uh, buffers which, which can be used for uh, making a precise control. For example, arrangement for the growth of magnetic uh, ferrite crystal. This, uh, these are lanthanum ferrites, uh, lanthanum uh, where lanthanum is the rare earth here and Fe has to be in 3 plus oxidation state and for this reason actually a copper oxide buffer is used um, so that uh, the formation of Fe 2 plus can be prevented. So, hydrothermal buffer systems are also uh, play a very vital role. Now, when we come to the uh, high temperature reaction in uh, hydrothermal process uh, what really happens and how does uh, the whole transformation occurs because we are operating at a very low temperature to prepare high temperature phases, but we are operating at a very high pressure. So, what really happens usually it is a liquid nucleation model that is suggested and this model differs from solid state reaction because in solid state synthesis it is mostly a diffusion controlled reaction where atoms do migrate between solid solid interface, but this is usually a liquid nucleation method that is uh, responsible for the uh, growth of oxides. Uh, due to enhanced solubility, solubility of water increases with temperature and if you are going to add alkaline uh, solvent uh, like hydroxide then the solubility will dramatically uh, increase with temperature and thereby this nucleation process can be uh, enhanced or moderated. 
Um, if you take the case of uh, silica uh, and its solubility in water as you see here you, when you increase the um, temperature the solubility very marginally increases and maximum solubility is aimed at 350 degree C for silica in the growth of quartz crystals. Whereas, the moment you put 1, 2, 3 percent of ammonia into it then the solubility of the same silica enhances to 560 or 515 grams per uh, liter. So, solubility can be enhanced with uh, this sort of additives. So, this is mostly a nucleation method. Now, if you take the case of barium titanate as an example, barium titanate is formed by the reaction of barium hydroxide and TaO2 and this gives BaTaO3 at a optimum temperature of 300 to 450 degree C in hydrothermal condition. But the proposed mechanism for barium titanate formation can either be viewed in two ways, one is in situ crystallization or dissolution recrystallization. Dissolution recrystallization is where you have barium hydroxide and titania has gone into one single homogeneous phase and from there recrystallization occurs which comes out as barium titanate or it could be a in situ crystallization one of this is getting crystallized and over which the other can form into a barium titanate. So, we need to know the proof of what sort of uh, process that is occurring which gives you a very nice uh, barium titanate morphology and this is the TM picture of those barium titanates which are formed. But what we see is there are three important things that happen which is weighing the or which proves as an indicator for dissolution recrystallization. Now, one thing is when varying the water isopropanol ratio in the synthesis the grain size of barium titanate decreases when amounts of alcohol increases. So, this is one clue that tells that something is happening when uh, the solvent is changed. Another thing is TM observations inc uh, of incompletely reacted powders show that there is uh, show that either it is a amorphous barium titanate phase or it is entirely a crystalline phase. You do not get to see both the cases in TM and then in high resolution uh, TM we also see that there is a presence of necks between particles. These three experimental observations suggest that there is a strong evidence for dissolution controlled um, recrystallization process which is occurring and uh, this necking actually can be seen here and this uh, this is the necking area between two particles which gives more indication that this is a um, dissolution induced recrystallization otherwise these two will be separated. And if it is a in situ uh, uh, crystallization then the model is you would not see uh, titania going into the solution where the titania solubility is much less than barium hydroxide because barium hydroxide can easily dissolve into water. So, in that case what you expect is the once a seed crystal of titania is formed then you have barium and other components coming and joining and then overall it will transform into a barium titanate process, but what is seen is that this is not a uh, heterogeneous crystallization process whereas, it is a complete dissolution. So, for in situ transformation um, what you would require is just a porous product which will act like a nucleation site and from there the whole thing can evolve, but for dissolution precipitation what you would see is a dissolution uh, should be much fast to ensure uh, a steady flow of reactants. So, um, by and large when we are trying to make uh, oxides uh, the solubility of the starting materials the mineralizers that you add will decide whether this process would go by the dissolution precipitation mechanism. Again uh, yeah, there are other uh, useful uh, insights that we can draw from uh, hydrothermal process. For example, this is a TM graph which clearly shows that TaO2 wires or tubes can be formed. Uh, so, this is uh, the way we do it take TaO2 dissolve it in sodium hydroxide in hydrothermal condition actually the crystals get rolled up uh, into a tube or into a uh, flake 
and uh, how does that happen um, you can see this sort of a two dimensional sheet is evolving, but under hydrothermal condition they get wrapped up into a tube like structure or like a wire like structure instead of going into a three dimensional network they get rolled up into cylindrical compacts and the reason is the two dimensional crystal flakes have low resistance to bending uh, in a normal uh, approach or using a conventional approach whereas hydrothermal energy actually curls these flakes into a tube therefore usually when we try to prepare um, oxides we either end up with nano wires or rods or tubes and this is mainly because this uh, resistance for bending is actually overcome by the high pressure and why tubes because when diameter grows the strain of the tubes is uh, outweighed by minimizing the energy and therefore you actually get nano tubes um, with these uh, in, uh, under hydrothermal conditions and um, also we get very uh, different morphologies for example nano flower type of a morphology uh, is observed for zinc oxides and why this nano flower uh, type is coming because of the um, CTAB assisted uh, uh, hydrothermal reaction. CTAB is nothing but uh, ammonium bromide with a long alkyl chain and if, if we are going to put uh, CTAB then we see this sort of uh, floral pattern coming where you get a nano flower like zinc oxide rod coming whereas if there is no uh, mineralizer that is added then you get separate individual particles of zinc oxide. So, this is uh, one of the clue that along with zinc hydroxide and water if you are going to put some mineralizer then we can get this sort of uh, pattern emerging uh, and this is the SEM uh, view graph of such nano flowers and uh, this is the TEM view graph clearly showing that such nano rods can be made. I will just uh, uh, stop with a few examples of uh, some of the noted uh, uh, oxides which can be selectively prepared using hydrothermal synthesis. One is uh, chromium dioxide as I already pointed out to you chromium hydroxide uh, is actually uh, in 4 plus which is very difficult to prepare. There are many reports nowadays where thin films have been uh, thin film technology has been used to stabilize uh, chromium 4 plus, but again there is a, a lack of clarity in the oxidation state of chromium. Why chromium 4 is uh, very difficult to prepare if you look at the temperature versus uh, pressure phase diagram you would see chromium uh, oxide is actually coming in this region and it, it is actually happening slightly above 400 and this is stabilized at very high pressures. So, this can only be achieved by hydrothermal process and under ambient conditions it is not possible at all. In lab scale people have tried to use seal tubes to prepare chromium uh, dioxide, but with great difficulty. So, to prepare chromium dioxide which is a ferromagnetic metal it is a big challenge and hydrothermal uh, reaction is one way that we can do it and uh, these are the uh, SEM micrographs which clearly tells how the uh, formation of CRO2 happens starting with the chromium uh, oxyhydroxide CROOH and uh, then uh, when you heat it uh, for a long time uh, under pressure then it transforms into CRO2 uh, like this and we can also try to isolate a uh, uh, rod shaped CRO2 which is actually needed. Now, if we prepare the CRO2 in uh, lab you would usually get a platelet or a uh, spherical shaped one which is actually not useful for uh, your recording media. What you need is this sort of uh, acicular shaped crystals which is uh, possible only through hydrothermal route and uh, here again um, uh, another group has also prepared uh, chromium oxide single crystals and you can see uh, this uh, shape and size selectivity that you can achieve using uh, hydrothermal synthesis. This is a typical uh, XRD pattern of uh, uh, CRO2 where you almost see a very small negligible percentage of CR2O3 sitting otherwise a very clean compound can be made 
and TGDTA clearly shows that these are indeed CRO2 crystals. Uh, the TG, DTG and DTA uh, thermograms uh, are indicative that this CRO2 to CR2O3 conversion occurs somewhere around 575 uh, Kelvin. There is another report where LACRO3 is made this is a perovskite compound and uh, th this is a very good uh, heating element uh, lanthanum chromite doped with strontium is a very good heating element and you can make this sort of uh, nice uh, shaped crystals and single crystalline uh, using hydrothermal process. But as you would see here uh, in this case there is a influence of stirring when you are trying to take aluminum hydroxide, chromium hydroxide and heat it in hydrothermal condition uh, with stirring you can see the crystallinity improves. So, each system holds some surprise and again uh, if you, the influence of alkalinity if you are going to take uh, potassium hydroxide mineralizer you would see the critical composition where uh, pH is 8 to 9 is the place where you would really get LACRO3 in single phase in other cases other compounds do pre precipitate. So, pH is a governing issue and then stirring uh, improves the crystallinity and also the uh, temperature seems to improve the crystallinity to a greater extent for LACRO3. And then we also have a hybrid model where you use microwave hydrothermal. This was actually uh, pioneered by Rustam Roy's group in uh, Penn State uh, as early as uh, um, late 80s. Uh, and this is a paper published in Material Research Bulletin showing how uh, with the different duration of microwave expo exposure uh, titania uh, particles can be prepared. And uh, there is also a comparison made between microwave assisted uh, hydrothermal process and conventional one. You can see here conventional hydrothermal process it requires days or hours together whereas in microwave uh, engineered hydrothermal process you can speed up the whole reaction. So, uh, this is a very useful way where you can uh, replace conventional uh, heating times using microwave to speed up uh, the reactions. And uh, this is another example of how zirconia can be made uh, microwave route uh, you just hours and a conventional route and then we can make comparison between um, microwave prepared and a conventional uh, hydrothermal uh, process. You can clearly see the uh, particle size distribution is distinctly different between these two. And uh, not only that the uh, most important or useful uh, application of hydrothermal synthesis is uh, preparing cage like structures because for host list uh, guest uh, chemistry where you can put selectively some reactions or even cracking of uh, uh, <coughs> of uh, alkanes in uh, or some alcohols into gasoline um, zeolites are used and specially creating such cage like structures hydrothermal synthesis has been used by and large and not only um, simple oxides complex oxides can also be prepared using hydrothermal roots. And uh, lastly I would like to show that uh, hydrothermal synthesis is still the most proven method for zeolite chemistry and zeolite chemistry has gone into a big industry now most of the catalysis uh, in automobile exhaust is mainly using uh, zeolites removing hardness of water is achieved using uh, zeolites usually starting with simple SI uh, O4 tetrahedra. We can try to make cage like uh, cuboid structures which has typical cage cavities which, which is useful for taking selectively some uh, gases effluent gases or uh, some solvents where uh, chemical reactions can be achieved. And uh, these are two people. Uh, Barrer and uh, Milton who are considered to be fathers of zeolites who first experimented the usefulness of zeolites in um, industrial processes and uh, the zeolites can actually be made using a uh, simple progression of reaction where you take amorphous product dissolute convert it into solution species and over a period of time it will come out as a uh, crystalline zeolite. So, one of the 
notable zeolite even now which is used in automobile exhaust is ZSM catalyst which is nothing but aluminum or gallium uh, oxide doped with silicon or germanium. So, this is still proven to be one of the most uh, powerful uh, catalysts running into billions of dollars. So, such cage like molecules can be prepared using hydrothermal process and here is another example of how zirconia can be made using a hydrothermal route and uh, the various uh, <coughs> parameters that are involved which affects the uh, structure of this zirconia uh, is also studied using hydrothermal route and uh, the toughening of zirconia can be modified with the addition of yttria or alumina and so on and uh, the fracture toughness of these zirconias have been uh, evaluated using hydrothermal process. Lastly, I just want to conclude uh, by saying uh, the pros and cons of hydrothermal synthesis. What are the advantage? One is you can discover many range of new materials because every particular reaction will bring about a new metastable phase easy and relatively cheap which can be experimental in a lab scale and the difficulties are uh, we need to understand the chemistry that is operating it is not just uh, generating very high pressure, but we need to understand uh, beforehand the nature of the components additives that you are using. Therefore, we need to have a, a knowledge of how to control this uh, morphology and size uh, this although uh, range is very big, but still limited to only few materials and uh, it is impossible to attain uh, variation in size uh, with this. Therefore, the, uh, the critical parameters that are involved are more than two. Therefore, a knowledge of the starting materials, the reaction conditions like pH, um, pressure, temperature, volume all these uh, forms important ingredients in hydrothermal reaction.